Andy Nicelli, professor of systematic theology at Bethlehem College and Seminary. By your estimation, how many books have you written? Co-authored will count as well. It's somewhere in the low to mid twenties. Favorite book. Out. Favorite book that you wrote. My favorite one is called How to Understand and Apply the New Testament, 12 Steps from Exegesis to Theology. It's basically my theological method that I teach students. Now, I hadn't seen your kids one on conscience. Mm -hmm. When did that one come out? 2019, 2020, I forget. Okay, so yeah. I'm way behind the curve. Yeah. I've got a 23-year-old, so he's <laughs> not going to read a kid's book on conscience. I was probably most helped by that book on conscience. Is that a common reaction, or is that yeah, rare? It's bizarre to me. I don't know why this is. People think of me as the conscience guy. I'm like, I've done all this other stuff. I'm like, I'm a Bible guy. I'm a theology guy. But yeah, it's, it's a, like, I'm the conscience guy. So that's cool. I'm happy to, to roll with it. Okay. <laughs> How about the book on Keswick theology, yeah. higher life stuff? Uh, what's been the reaction to that book? Uh, almost, except for the people who are Keswick theologians today. Really good. Um, that came out of my part of my upbringing and my, my college I went to, and I just analyze it, and my argument is that it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any elaboration <laughs> on that? Just slightly. Yeah, so um, Keswick theology, or higher life theology, views the Christian life kind of like Clark Kent and Superman. Yeah. So you go from just normal average or below average to, boom, you are living the victorious life, uh, because you're filled with the Spirit, uh, and you're living above sin, uh, but then you come kind of crashing down. You have to get refilled, and it's just—it's every time you sin, it's because you weren't filled with the Spirit, and it just—it's a tail span of, uh, I think, a life of defeat. So basically, I argue there's a better way. Don't let go and let God. What J.I. Packer said is better: trust God and get going. Hmm. Yeah, I like that one. We gave a little talk on that overseas, and that was. The thing I like most about those two books is they're really readable. I mean, you can give them to a 13-year-old early in the faith, and they can they can grasp. Which one? No Quick Fix? No Quick Fix and Conscience. Conscience yeah. was like, I'm excited that our students so, got exposed to that. Today. One of the most discouraging things to me is that this bad theology has been exported all over the world. Mm. So I think of it as you know England and America uh, as tracing the history of it, but then I learned it's been exported everywhere. So it's not just a, a British and American thing. Yeah. Okay, the book Conscience, how, how would missionaries, so here you're on Radius Campus, you're yep. teaching to the student body, give me some practical aspects how that would play itself out in a missions context, mm -hmm. that particular book, problems it would address, things that would help potential missionaries. Yeah, my co-author, J.D. Crowley, has been a missionary for decades, mm -hmm. and he tells a story that when he first moved to Cambodia, he planted a mango tree, and it took four or five years to grow, and the first year it bore fruit. I think there were two or three mangoes on it. And he was, they weren't ripe yet, but he was watching them thinking, I'm gonna have mangoes. And then a Cambodian native came to do concrete work. And while he was working, he plucked and ate all three mangoes. And JD is ticked. Like, that guy stole from me. And I don't know, remember how he communicated this, but he came to find out that uh, the Cambodian was actually more upset that JD was being stingy then J.D. was upset that he ate his mangoes. So if J.D. were to preach that Sunday on you shall not steal, he'd have a, an application right there to share. And that's where it hit him. If I were to apply this command, don't steal, to don't eat my mangoes, that would not land in that culture. Mm. Because in that culture, that's not wrong. Mm. So the question is, well, is it wrong or is it not wrong? Well. Jesus walked through fields and he was plucking grain. Old Testament Mosaic law allows for people to walk through a field and, and, and pluck. Or, so in some cultures, it's not wrong. In our American culture, you don't do that. That's called stealing. But in other, other cultures, that's not called stealing. So what J.D. learned is when you're in another culture, there are certain things that they do that from their perspective, they're not wrong. And if you seize on those and try to appeal to their conscience Hey, you're a sinner. Let me give you an example. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have a, yes, the conscience connects and condemns them. Mm. They're gonna get a blank stare or yeah. a, what are you talking about? So that's that's a helpful thing for missionaries to understand is, when you do preach on sin, a good starting point is to make sure that what you're calling sin is what they also understand as sin, uh, so uh, they will feel that conviction. Uh, further, uh, for conscience issues is 
if you are unable to be flexible in any area, mm. then and then you change cultures, you may not be able to be helpful in teaching and preaching the gospel because you can't flex on what you eat or what you wear or your views on cleanliness or time management or you know punctuality. Mm. There are all kinds of different cultural issues yeah. where if you insist on no my English way is the right way, uh, you're going to be a terrible missionary. So summarizing maybe that they've got to know their Bible really well, and then they've got to know the culture of what they're speaking into, the combination of those two. Now you've got a missionary that knows how to apply biblical truth really well. It's kind of like uh, Bible translation lived out. Hmm. To do do Bible translation well, you have to understand the receptor language, Greek and Hebrew, really well, and you have to understand the language you're translating into. Hmm. And if you're good at one but not good at the other, it's not going to be overall great. But you got to be really good at both to then have a good translation. Yeah, I mean, the two hallmark translators in my <clears throat> understanding have always been Tyndale, or two, three, Tyndale, Luther, and then Adoniram Judson. Because they knew the receptor language, they also knew the language of the people so well. I mean, Tyndale affects the English language more than Shakespeare does. He so just... the way this carries over is I, I teach Greek. And it's common for me to uh, train a guy for a year, two, three years, and they think, yeah, I know Greek. And they, they're overconfident. Mm. They're way overconfident. If you meet a guy who grew up speaking another language, like Spanish, yeah. and then he knows English, and you ask him, hey, would you translate this theological article from your heart language to my language? They'll be like, this is really hard. Uh, they understand. Yeah. You have to know both languages really well. Uh, same thing with cultures. Uh, you can be overconfident that, oh, I understand theologically what we need to do, so put me in, coach. I go yeah. anywhere. Well, to be really effective somewhere else, it involves a little more cultural like to Jesus than you might be thinking. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm. there's a school of thought, you and I have talked about this briefly, where there are so, never in the history of the world have there been so many resources gathered, good biblical resources gathered into one language, the English-speaking language. And mm-hmm. so knowing Greek and Hebrew, helpful, I think what you're kind of pointing to is something that I point to in the translation class is that most guys don't know Greek and Hebrew to the level. They're they're pretty much dangerous. They're not effective at being translators. Yep. But there's also this side where they know they're very vaguely familiar with it, but they know where to get to the resources or they know Greek and Hebrew really well. But either one of those, would you equate those as similar or would you have a very similar? Okay. Yeah. So with the translation issue, you got to know your limitations. Yeah. You have to recognize I know it this well and be careful with how you use it. Mm. That's fine. And uh, with the missionary context, culturally, if you're aware of how culturally deficient you are and how you need to learn, yeah. you're in a better place. Yeah. There is a vein of thought in missions today that we're losing ground to the birth rates in India and China and all these places where babies are just coming out. Christianity isn't getting out fast enough. Let's not train people so much. They don't need to be carrying all of these resources with them. They don't need to get this highly specialized training. Radius takes way too long. What you're talking about is way too long. People are dying and going to hell. Let's send them out in larger waves, but let's let's make sure they know the gospel, but let's send them out as quickly and as fast and in broad numbers as possible. Good thought or bad thought? <laughs> How could that be a good thought? That's horrible. That's uh, like... Um, you're just sending people out to do good, but they're not equipped. It's like, think of the medical world. Uh, there are people all over the world dying of diseases. Just send people who love people. Mm. Uh, they don't know what to do when they get there. So this kind of vaguely know how to use a Band-Aid or like, what, what are we doing? What are we sending? Be much more effective to send five highly capable and equipped doctors than to send a whole bunch of well-intentioned people who don't know what they're doing. They'll actually do worse. Mm. They'll, they'll do damage. So... I think that the people we send should be more like Green Berets or maybe even Navy SEALs <laughs> who are few but highly equipped and specialized and able to do work well. So you would advocate for take time, make sure they're well trained. doesn't matter if our church, like we're going to pour into these five, we're going to pour into these three, these two, these one rather than, hey, you know what, there's a huge need that's out there. We're just going to we're gonna press people through, not willy-nilly, but they, they got to be excitable people. they got to be people that are wanting to. You're going to advocate for the much smaller. Sharpen the X, make it effective, and send the kind of people overseas that you would be content to be your leaders here. Mm. It's not like, oh, I don't think they can be an elder in our church, but overseas, we could send them overseas. I could get rid of them. Or, like, <laughs> come on, we got to send our best. 
Yeah. That's a great... I mean, we generally say, if you wouldn't make them a greeter in your <laughs> church, because like, there's this really bad idea that, well, they're strange here, they'll be perfect in Indonesia. And, like, there's some pastors that think that. Like, he's kind of quirky. Like, we would never want him interacting with people, let alone being an elder. India's kind of weird. Let's send him there. Like, that that thought, I'm surprised how it still dominates in certain circles. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Okay, good enough. Um... Contextualization in missions. Uh, we were talking about that. You were talking about that a little bit in class today. Uh, give me just your general overview of contextualization. Is contextualization good, bad? Just a general look at that whole issue. That's like saying is compromise good or bad. If you're compromising on morals, mm. bad. If you're compromising on issues that you have flexibility to compromise on, like I want to go to Chipotle and you want to go to some authentic Mexican place, I'll compromise and go where you want to go, even though Chipotle's pretty good. Um, that, that's, Chipotle that, that's not You're a moral a steak compromise. Guy. I take you to a seafood restaurant and you eat steak. <laughs> that, was, that was not a mistake. That was very good. Okay. Protein. All right. Good Focus. Enough. So, okay. uh, if you're contextualizing in a way that you compromise the gospel, it's just unequivocally evil, bad. Never do that. An example I shared in class today is if you're teaching a class on world religions mm-hmm. and you take your students with you to go to a mosque, and to go to a synagogue and go to a Roman Catholic service, fine. You can learn a lot from observing, meet with the religious leaders, ask respectful questions. You can learn that way. But as soon as you move from that to, oh, we'd like to participate in your idolatrous worship service. We'd like to pray uh, to your false gods. We'd like to, you know, that's idolatrous. That is, if that's what you mean by contextualization, yeah, I'm out. That's no good. In the mission world, there, there's a C1 through 6 scale, and C5 and C6 are more like the that. C scale, the C scale, the famous right. C scale, yeah. And I think the if you're contextualizing in permissible ways, it's never idolatrous. It's never compromising the gospel. It's basically you're exercising freedom in areas for the sake of the gospel, but never betraying the gospel. That's so fine. the key is not betraying the gospel, right? right. Like, uh, can you eat dog to the glory of God in a particular awkward uh, social gathering? Praying with hands like this as opposed to this. How's that? <laughs> Fine, okay. whatever. But, I mean, you're a seminary guy, so you're going to want, like, pews and hymnals and stuff, right? Like that's... <laughs> I, I do like pews and hymnals, I, I but I don't think you need to export that like a Starbucks across the world. Because that's a knock that the guys yeah. that will be the C5, C6, where you get insider movements, yeah. like, they'll say, well, that's because you have this vestige I'm of Westernism. I'm not franchise missions. No, I'm not, that every, every store looks the same. I'm saying... Uh, the, what you're duplicating is the core of the gospel and what God has told us to do in church meetings. So, preach the word. So, songs that would sound more culturally appropriate, or the cadence, or the we talk. Oh, that's a that's 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 a, all a matter of wisdom. What about being involved in the mosque? You know that there are people around you that are praying to Allah, but you're there. You're praying to Christ, and you know that in your heart. Totally so confusing. Can, totally confusing. And the people around you don't know that. You're sending a mixed message at best. Uh, I'd call that foolish. So wouldn't advocate for that? No. Okay. Uh, That's a, insider movement. Make an team. argument for that. Like, what, what would the, what would, be a, what would be a good argument for doing that? Well, that I have my relationship with Christ. You don't know my heart. I'm, I stand and fall before one master, as do you. Why would I, why would I want to potentially lose the impact with my, they'll use this word called oikos. I'll use my, lose my impact with my neighbors, my friends, the guys that I go to mosque. If I come out as a Christian, you're telling me to walk away from my family, my entire circle of influence. Oh, I see. Is, you're talking about someone who's already a Muslim who converts. Who's also a yeah, yeah. Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist, but they yeah. convert and that conversion, they'll lose access to some of those people. So why don't I just participate in that? But in my heart, I know that I'm, I'm actually praying to the one true God. I would like to see scriptural support for that. Mm. Uh, so we should be willing to be persecuted for our faith in Christ. Uh, I know it's easy for me to say from my vantage point, mm. uh, but that doesn't seem like you're publicly honoring your Lord by doing that. It seems like you're hiding your relationship to Christ. Yeah. The most popular missions methodology out there, you could group it, all of these different names and acronyms. So you have like church planting movements, disciple making movements, four fields, rapid church planting, all these things kind of under movement methodology. Churches are, gatherings of believers are birthed rather quickly. Um, Conversions, conversion isn't necessarily noted as like a, 
a punctiliary event. It's a process. It'll happen sometimes over weeks, over years. Whether or not this actually happened at a specific day, that's largely irrelevant. These things are kind of part and parcel to the movement methodology. Churches get planted really quickly in this, but they also die quite quickly. And if you follow up statistics are kind of brutal to read at times. Are you Have you heard much about movement methodologies or those types of things? I've heard Mark Dever talk about this, so that's that's what I know. Okay. So <laughs> probably on the other end of this right, table at right. some other interview. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won't press you too deeply on but that. But from what Mark has said, I'm totally with Mark, if I'm understanding it correctly, yeah. that what we should value is real genuine churches. Mm. The growth will be slower, mm. but it'll be steady and longer lasting. And that we want fruit that lasts. So I'd go with that way. Come off, uh, I mean, so one of the interesting things I thought you said, and just set the table for First Corinthians this morning when you were talking about it, was it was such a baby church, mm-hmm. and it imported mm-hmm. all of these issues from their mm-hmm. secular background. Is that, that surely would be common around the world. What would good church planters do to, apart from having apostolic authority like right. Paul, what, how would they guard against having immature churches that continue to be immature and eventually die? Well, uh, the church at Corinth maybe it was 18 months, two years old when Paul's writing this letter. They're, they're brand new Christians and yeah. they're first generation. They don't have any history of Christianity. So it's not surprising that they have imported into Christianity all kinds of false ideas and immoral ways of living. So Paul's having to say, no, don't do that. Here's why. Don't do that. Here's why. We need to repent of this. That's not how Christians think. This isn't how Christians live. It's inconsistent with the gospel. It is over. And over. Ten different issues. He does it in First mm-hmm. Corinthians. I think that's you should just expect that kind of stuff when you take the gospel to a new place, that they have generations of pagan thinking, and it's, what else are they going to bring with them? That's just their whole worldview. So the process is weeding out what's contrary to the gospel. So if you're shepherding people in that context, it, you have to be very aware of what they're saying in that culture, and it's going to mm-hmm. kind of pop up, oh, no, no, not that, here's nothing, nope, can't, that's not inconsistent, here's why. And it's going to take time, mm. but then you develop a culture that's more consistent with Scripture, a, a worldview that's more consistent, and I think subsequent generations won't have those problems in that way to the same degree. So, I mean, subsequent generations, I think that's an important thing. So you shouldn't look for these changes to happen in weekends or in even two or three years. Like, there's going to be some of these issues. I appreciate you talking about J.D. and the second generation mm-hmm. of his church. I was... So our church, where we planted a church in Yembe Yembe, they had drums that they quickly moved into the church service as part of our uh, process in worship. But then there were these flutes that had very specific spirit connotations to them. And it's only in the second generation that they've even considered bringing the flutes in. Interesting. But I think that generational jump, I mean, would you say, just looking at the book of 1 Corinthians and church history, but some of these issues are generational. It's going to take a long time before they start to become solid enough to where they can view things so, that way. So, yes, that generational issue you pointed out would be re- with reference to what do we associate with pagan idolatrous worship practices. And that's that's right. I was thinking more of it takes a while for the gospel to work into the culture uh, so that they're thinking more in line with what's true. Hmm. It's so much of First Corinthians, like they deny the bodily resurrection of their own bodies. Um, that was related to their their pagan way of thinking or they're uh, taking people to civil uh, civil lawsuits above the uh, before the courts or they're having immoral sex or whatever it's stuff in line with their culture that that needs to be removed and then their worldview shaped by truth and if you grow up in a context where truth is prevailing then that baggage wouldn't be there to the same degree subsequently no no i think all of that i mean it just keeps coming back to Play the long game, play the long game, play the long game. Because some of these things will be rooted out in days. But a lot of them, they're just baggage that's going to pop up later. It's amazing, even in our context, seeing what the second generation church leaders, what they struggle with, where the first generation church leaders had a whole different batch of problems that were much more brutal and tough to deal with, where the second generation, they're different issues, but they're much more encouraging to think through, this is how far it's come in the second generation. But yeah, I wish so bad I could have met JD when I was in... Cambodia for that one trip. It sounds like he he added a lot to the conscience book is what you said. He gets it. He's great. Yeah. Uh, You've been at Radius now for 48 hours. Thoughts? um, Recommendations? Anything that you would say to pastors, just from putting on your pastor's hat for Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, uh, would you recommend this to pastors? Why or why not? I don't think so. 
Just kidding. Um, it's great. Um, no, I like you guys, and I, I see a, a like a it's a finishing school that's offering elements that we can't give in the classroom and seminary, hmm. and even some churches just aren't equipped to focus on. Maybe some bigger churches could do some of it, but you've got guys with different expertises about, well, here's how you would handle if you're kidnapped, or here's what you do if you come for this hostile government, or here's how to think about this language acquisition uh, when you go to like a level two, two and then try to get a level three, uh, the E2, E3 deal. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're more specific in training them for that in ways that are just helpful finishing touches. It's kind of like they, if students go to school to be a doctor, they're in the classroom, they've read the textbooks, and now right before they become doctors, hey, go spend a few years doing a residency with this guy or at this place, get some experience, have them look over your shoulder, and then, then we'll send you out. It's kind of like that, not not in every way, but it's they're coming in here and it's just, okay, there are a few more things to understand before we send. And uh, I think there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. Top five books that you would recommend for aspiring missionaries can go all across the board. If you were thinking about, and you're about to take your wife, let's say you're back two daughters ago, your two daughters going to the field, what are the top five books that you would recommend for people to read? So I watched D.A. Carson get interviewed a lot, and whenever someone asked him this question, he would severely critique the interviewer and okay. say, well, how, how do I t pick just five? Or how do I, so you can go to 15 It's if just you so want. subjective. So well, I, you mentioned a great one today in class. but um, oh, Right. So I would want to understand who am I talking to, where is he deficient? Young, somewhere in the middle of his seminary years, but going to be on the field most likely in about three years. So I, where I would gravitate is, how well do you know your Bible? Uh, so read basic books on interpretational challenges, hermeneutics, uh, how to understand and apply the Bible. Um, so to Jason DeRoshi wrote a good one called How to Understand and Apply the Old Testament, hmm. 12 Steps from Exegesis to Theology. Very, very good. It's, our books are brother-sister. Uh, maybe brother-brother. And uh, so that's a good one. I, I would pick classics like Calvin's Institutes or Herman Bavinck's Reformed Dogmatics. Uh, I'd pick, uh, or a modern accessible one like Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, or uh, I really like Steve Wallum's new Systematic Theology. Have you read it? I have. Okay. It's fantastic. This is volume one. Volume two is coming. He's my favorite living Systematic Theologian. True. Then I think of other classics. So I mentioned in class John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. That's worth reading once a year. Spurgeon read it, I think, 100 times. Yeah. Uh, it's staple it's of diet. It's so good. It's the best single book on Christian living that I know of. Okay. I love it, love it, love it. Um, I'd recommend fiction. You think, what? Okay. Uh, so I just wrote a book called How to Read a Book. <laughs> and Look at uh, you, taking over from more to more Adler. It's, well, it, but I call it, the subtitle is Advice for Christian Readers. So it's got a new spin. It's specifically to help Christians. And in there, okay. I, I argue that fiction expands your mind and affections in a way that nonfiction can't. Hmm. It gives you a glimpse into human nature that uh, you can't get other ways. Uh, remember Mike Bulmore, my former pastor, asked me once when I was a PhD student, so, Andy, what, what fiction are you reading? And I thought my answer would please him. I was like, uh, Mike, I'm just, I'm just too busy for that. I'm just reading next to Jesus and theology. That's, that's all I could do. And he's like, Andy, I'm so sad for you. You need to rethink this. Uh, hmm. What, what, what? And he, so, so he made his case, and I've been reading fiction ever since. Um, so it could be Lord of the Rings, that kind of thing, or Narnia. But there, there are a lot of good options. I like, like to read stories about Navy SEALs or that sort of thing. I just love good stories, and uh, I think it helps you remember how to interact with people. So if, if all you read is exegetical books, you might have precise ways of thinking, but you'll be really weird to interact with. So it stretches you in ways that yeah. some of the other books, classics, yeah. anything else, can maybe doesn't stretch those particular muscles. That's right. Okay. That's right. Speaking of stretching muscles, did you work out with the students today? I did. So there are two campuses here, and evidently I was at the, the Wimpier campus. Uh, Wimpier? What? You brought your Bethlehem guy, and he's like limping around? No, no, he's just, he's just injured. So okay. he's, he's, he's great. Um, but they're all in the background. That's why the Navy <laughs> SEALs and the military and the, yeah, all of those things are getting a little bit It was extra like uh, as many reps as possible for some basic <clears throat> movements, and we all had a good time. But it, there wasn't any competition or any pushing. Okay. So, yeah. Well, there's After this campus tomorrow morning. Is, uh, much more you may aggressive. have to come back here by 545 tomorrow morning. Okay. So see how that goes. <laughs> uh, elevator pitch on Bethlehem Seminary and College. One of the things that I thought was interesting is I've understood Bethlehem more and more as the cohort model, which right. we subscribe to here. Right. 
what are the benefits of that? What's the benefits of Bethlehem right now? In comparison, just your straight up pitch on why Bethlehem is a good institution for young men, especially. Yeah, several reasons. One is it is a cohort model. So you take all your classes with the same group of guys, or if you come to college, guys and gals, and you get to invest in each other and know each other well. Uh, it's, it's a sweet model. Um, and our professors are theologically aligned. So some schools you go to, and this guy's Pado Baptist, and this guy's not. This guy's an egalitarian. This guy's a complementarian, and it's just kind of pick and choose the views, on on the big stuff and the not so big stuff. We are really in sync, hmm. and that's that's sweet. So you can get a unified teaching uh, across the board, and it's very affordable. I mean, I'm looking at some schools even in Southern California. They're like sixty thousand a year. Uh, Why is it so affordable? What what do they have that? Well, just... for one, we don't have a huge impressive campus. Uh, it's we meet in classrooms for Sunday school, like Sunday school classrooms with like little potties for the kids. Like it's it's <laughs> very unimpressive on the outside. Uh, we invest in getting faculty. We have a library, and it's it's a very disproportionate impact. So it's very, and we have a lot of donors. So I forget the percentage, but the students pay a very small percentage of what it actually costs. So most of them come out without student debt. That's the goal. That's okay. the goal. So you vouch for it because of the cohort model, mm -hmm. the tightness of staff, like as far as their, mm -hmm. not unanimity, but unity, especially on the mm -hmm. first and secondary issues. Right. Anything else? I love our theology. So we have, if you know who John Piper is, you obviously do. Uh, Familiar with that He's guy. our chancellor. I've heard about him. And uh, we, we just celebrate big God theology and mm -hmm. missions. That's our heartbeat. So that's why I'm actually here at Radius, is I love what you're doing. Praise God. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.